address our, our students who come from 100 colleges across the country uh, is Professor Robert Murphy. He is the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism. He has his Ph.D. in economics from New York University and is a former professor at Hillsdale College. He's now an adjunct scholar with the Ludwig von Mises Institute and an analyst at the Laffer Associates. Uh, please welcome Dr. Robert Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Schlafly. Well, it's great to be here, and this is a very uh, exciting event. I'm sure you guys are enjoying it, and even uh, we authors are, are enjoying it, hearing people talk about their areas of expertise. But I have to admit, it's a bit sort of depressing, because I know what I do in my book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism, is I go through and how everything you hear in your schools and in the mainstream media about the free market is just dead wrong, both theoretically, that if you just listen to the claims that you hear over and over and just think about it, even if you had been locked in a room for your whole life and then you know, just heard these, these claims that they're internally inconsistent, they make no sense on the face of it, and then also the historical record that they point to to back up these claims is just wrong. The, the things they tell you about history aren't true. And so I know that in my area, for, you know, the, when it comes to the free market and how a capitalist system works, but when I hear these other people talking, I realize that that's true in all of their areas of expertise also, that basically everything you're learning at school is wrong. And you know, so you sort of raise the question, like, what the heck are you guys getting out of college? And I, you know, I hope you learn how to throw a good party. Maybe that's a reason to go. But um, so, so in, in my book, there's plenty of topics. And in the uh, interest of trying to compete with these people over here, let me try to focus on some of the more shocking and outrageous things that I talk about. The, I, I think one to focus on is discrimination. So I'll talk about that, and I realize we're on a time constraint, so I will leave time at the end for questions. So when it comes to discrimination, uh, I think we first need to be clear on exactly what we mean, because a lot of people throw around related terms like, like racism and discrimination and prejudice. And so when, when people talk about what would happen in a purely free market that the government doesn't regulate, and then compared to what we have in our, our great system now because of the benevolence of uh, wise politicians in the past and the laws that they passed, I think we need to be clear. So most people wouldn't, they don't have a problem with racism or prejudice per se as long as it didn't influence your outward behavior. And so, you know, suppose I'm walking around and I just really hate people from Switzerland. I can't stand them. But you wouldn't know that from talking to me, okay? And that in my behavior when I hire people and when I make decisions where I go to eat and things like that, you had no idea that I harbored this inner prejudice, then I think most people would say, okay, you shouldn't be penalized for that, because that, that really would be thought control. And even most of our opponents at least would say that you know, we're not in the business of thought control. Now, some people would probably argue with, it, with that claim, but I think that most of them would admit that, no, we're not trying to penalize what goes on in your head. We're trying to make sure you don't act unfairly and, and really harm someone else's livelihood. So really what we're talking about when we talk about what sort of things is the government supposed to make sure don't happen that would happen if we had a, pure, a free, unregulated market, really the term would be discrimination, where someone is treated unfairly because of perhaps the prejudices or racism harbored by the person with power. And so be before we, we really analyze that, though, let's just let me give you some examples just to, to clarify our thinking here. So some of you may have watched the movie The Hours, and it was a, a successful movie, and, and I, I watched it because my wife liked it, but um, I have to admit I liked it as well. But it, it, was, it was a chick flick, I'm not going to lie to you. And uh, it was you know, a, a very uh, star-studded cast of uh, actresses, and one of them was Nicole Kidman was playing the role of, she was Virginia Woolf, the author. And... Um, now, now, what if when they were casting for that role and they had people coming in and, you know, Nicole Kidman came in and other famous actresses may have come in and read for the part. Suppose Dustin Hoffman walked in and he had this script and he was getting ready to read for the part. And you can imagine people would have, it would have been sort of uncomfortable and, and they would have, you know, been, you know, there would have been, you know, uh, people talking and whispering. And he starts reading the lines and they go through it and they say, well, thank you, Mr. Hoffman. You know, really respect your work, but I, I don't think you're right for the part. And suppose he kept pressing them. And he said, what, what, you think I'm a bad actor? You don't, you don't like the way I read that line? You, don't, you didn't believe that I was really into the character? And eventually, the answer would have to be, well, well no, you're, you're a man. And you, know, you, you can't possibly hire you for this position. And he could say, no, I could play a woman. I was in Tootsie. I mean, didn't you like what I did there? 
right? So he can convincingly play a woman. And again, though, you, you think, well, no, because if we cast you, that would just distract people. You know, they'd be watching the movie and they would know it was you. And it just wouldn't fit. And so really, if you think about it, the reason he would be denied that job is that he was a man. That would be the fundamental reason. I mean, they might try to dress it up, but that would be the reason. Now, is that unfair sexual discrimination? Is that something that we need to pass laws against? Most people wouldn't be too outraged over that. And you would say it's not just that Dustin Hoffman is a famous actor and he's rich and he doesn't you know, need the law to protect him. I mean, even if you look at community theater where people were struggling and eating ramen every, every night of the week and they were trying to get a part, if someone were trying to play a historical figure and wanted to be something that they weren't, uh, probably people wouldn't think that that was outrageous. And that's not what we mean when we're saying we're against the sort of discrimination that would happen allegedly in a purely free market. Uh, another example, and a lot of, uh, I'm not the first to mention this one, if you look at the NBA, obviously the proportion of black players there is far greater than their sample in the population at large, or their proportion of the population at large. And is that prima facie evidence of rampant bias in the NBA? And most people, again, would, would say probably not. Now, if you do talk to some people, and I, I have, I'm certainly not um, the caliber myself, but I know some, some people who played professional uh, sports and uh, upper-level college sports, and they, and they do say that, yeah, there, there are biases and that if you're a white guy, they, that it's harder for you to, to uh, make it a certain basketball team. I, I can't confirm that, like I say, but there is that. But I think the, the overall uh, majority of the population would believe that, no, there's not rampant outrageous discrimination in the NBA, that there are other reasons that lead to that outcome. It's not discrimination. All right, so there's all, there's all kinds of cases like this that you can go through that, you know, there aren't that many women probably who are coal miners, things like that. And it's, again, not necessarily that it's because of just pure discrimination. So you can go through all kinds of cases like that. So so what it, what is it exactly that people mean when they talk about discrimination? So we know it's not merely the fact of Hiring some, making a hiring decision based on someone's uh, characteristics, you know, their race or their sex, because the Dustin Hoffman case proves that, well, no, that's not really what it is. And then it's also not just if the pool of your employees don't exactly mirror those ratios that are in the population at large, because that's the NBA case rules that out. And so really, if you push somebody and you say, what is it that you're afraid would happen in a free market that you think is really unfair and we need to have laws against it, if you pushed them to be really specific, I think they would have to say, okay, if there were, if you had two candidates and one of them, uh, you know, could do whatever the job was in such a, it, it was better than the other candidate, and again, taking all the factors into consideration, really, if one candidate would give more to the firm's bottom line, if this candidate would be more productive, and the employer, because of his prejudice, hired the other candidate, and that's what we mean by discrimination, okay? And that's what needs to be penalized, either fined or, you know, even having jail terms, what have you, in a, in a, that was what would happen in a free market. And that's what the government needs to protect us from, okay? But if that's what we mean by discrimination, well, then those laws are superfluous because the free market automatically penalizes that, all right? And not only does the free market automatically penalize discrimination the way I've just defined it, it does it in exactly the right proportion commensurate with how much or how bad the discrimination is. All right, so for example, if, if somebody hires uh, his brother-in-law over some other candidate, most people would say, okay, he shouldn't be beheaded. All right, That's, that would be a, a punishment exceeding what the crime was. All right, so there should be some fine or there should be some sort of uh, punishment, but you don't want to cut the guy's head off for doing that. And so if you start thinking, okay, well, well what, how should we gauge it? And again, it should have something to do with, well, how gross was the, uh, the nepotism in this case, right? If the, if the two candidates were pretty similar in their productivity, but he you know, gave a slight preference for his brother-in-law, even though the guy maybe wasn't quite as qualified, then he should be fine, but not, not that much, right? Whereas if you had two candidates and one person was just a top-flight candidate, it was clear he had all the degrees from the right universities, and the other guy was just a complete hack, and he was just hiring this guy because he's a, you know, my religion and I don't like this other guy, well, then you, people might say, well, his fine should be heavier in that case because that's just an extremely biased, prejudiced decision, whereas the guy who hired his brother-in-law, if it was really close, maybe he wasn't even conscious of what he was doing. Right? So you can see that, again, if you try to push these people to say, well, you know, what, what would your ideal system do? How would it handle cases like these? Again, it would focus on discrimination in terms of behavior where 
the firm's bottom line would be best served by hiring the one candidate and then you for some reason choose the other one and again the punishment ideally would be commensurate with well how bad was the bias you know these two candidates that you were choosing between how close were there how far apart were they and again if and that seems pretty reasonable but of course you can imagine I'm setting it up to, to show you that's exactly what happens in a pure unregulated free market right that just think about it you've got two candidates one of them, all things considered, would bring in $100,000 to the firm. The other candidate would bring in $110,000 to the firm. All right, and let's say the salary you're going to pay is $85,000. And so the employer knows that if he, if he hires the candidate who, who brings in less, then he's automatically losing out on that extra money that he could have had. All right, so it's, it's not a fine in the sense that it's money taken from his bank account, but it's potential income that he could have had. Right, that this candidate, the qualified one, would have given him 35000 or whatever the numbers work out to be, and the other one would have only given him $10,000. And so by hiring the one because you know, he looks like me or I don't like Muslims or whatever the reason is that he's not hiring the more qualified candidate, then he is effectively leaving money on the table there. Okay? So in a free market, employers are fined for practicing discrimination as we've defined it, and I think most people agree that's the way we ought to be defining what we're talking about. And not only that, it's exactly in proportion to how bad the discrimination is. And the beauty of this is that you don't need to have inspectors going out and trying to find it. This happens automatically, just the way we've we thought about it and we realize what would happen. Anytime an employer does that, automatically, if he hires somebody who's less qualified because of truly irrelevant characteristics, then that's potential profit he could have been earning that he's now not getting because of his bias. All right, and that happens automatically. He doesn't need to be caught by his shareholders. It doesn't need to, you know, someone doesn't need to go through the books and then realize after the fact and go back and, and rectify it. It happens automatically. He's leaving money on the table. Okay, so that's that's just one example. Now, when you, when you say something like that, you, you, people who are dead set against that mentality, they could be nodding their heads but thinking, okay, th this is crazy. Yeah, I, you, you made a nice little argument there, and I'm not sure exactly where the mistake in your logic is, but I know you're wrong. That, that's wrong. I mean, just open your eyes, look around even the United States, let alone the rest of the world, and do you mean to tell me with a straight face that there's not un injustice out there, that there aren't huge disparate income or outcomes that seem to fall on certain groups who happen to also be unpopular, and you're telling me that that's just fine, that no, those people are all, you know, they're getting a, a fair deal. And, and no, in general, I would say no, that's, that's not what I'm saying, but the problem is not with the free market. Okay, so one thing is we don't have a free market. So it's always difficult to argue like this because it sounds like you're defending the status quo when that's not really the case. And so, for example, in, in government, uh, government projects, like if the government wants to build a building or do anything like that where they put it out for bids, as I think uh, Tom Woods even talked about earlier, there are certain uh, regulations in place that had to do with the union movement so that, for example, you have to pay the prevailing wages. When they, when they t put out a bid, I think it was, goes back to the Davis-Bacon Act, when, they, when the government puts out a bid for a contract, it can't just give it to the low bidder, again, assuming that the person seems reputable and they can do the job. It's not allowed to do that if the bid is so low that it's less than the prevailing uh, wages would dictate. And that goes back to what it's, I mean, this is historical record. The senators and people who voted for this act were clearly racist, and that was their motivation. They were saying, we're afraid of, I mean, this, this was back in the early 1900s, they are saying, we were afraid of colored labor coming up and competing with white unions, and it would demoralize wage rates and things like that. So they were worried about, you've got these white unions, and the government's bidding on projects, and then we've got all these, what they were calling colored workers coming up from the South, and they're saying, we could do that job, we can build that building for, you know, 50% of what these white unions are charging you. And so the government, it didn't want to blatantly just say, no, we're going to give it to the white union, because that would be obvious. And so instead, they passed this act which said the government is not allowed to pay less than some fraction of the prevailing wages in the region, which, of course, would include the wages that these white union workers were getting. All right, so it was a, a subtle way to funnel tax dollars into the hands of politically powerful unions who happened to be made up of white people, and then these black contractors couldn't get the work. All right, so that was certainly racism. That was institutionalized racism, and yet that probably is, uh, you know, a feather in the cap of the labor movement to say, look at this great thing that we did in American history. And if you heard about the Davis-Bacon Act, 
in your schools, I'm sure most people probably would not point to that and say this was an example of institutionalized racism. And again, but you can go read the quotes, and some of this is in my book, of the people when they passed it, what they were saying in defense of it. So I'm not just speculating as to what their motives must have been. You can, you can see what, they, what their arguments were. Okay, so that's one example. Uh, a different topic that people talk about a lot, and when I, I mention the book, has to do with uh, salary. So you hear, any time a professional athlete is uh, complaining about his pay, and you, know, you, always, you always get letters to the editor saying things like, you know, here we've got these prima donnas, and what, what does this guy do? He throws a little white ball really fast at a catcher, and he gets millions of dollars, whereas our, our math teachers in high school only get 40 grand a year, whatever they get paid. And, you know, where are our nation's priorities, right? That's the sort of thing you hear all the time. And that, you know, we as a nation are just discussing that how can we not give more to our teachers than to the uh, professional athletes. Now, it, it's interesting because part of what we're doing today is just to tell you how bad your teaching has been. And so you might say, well, maybe that's why. But, uh, but it's, but so let's just think about that a little bit. Now, the, the best analogy or, or counterexample to that sort of thinking that I like to use, and it usually catches people off guard, is to say, okay, you know, you're, you're right, that is a good point, and by the same token, you know, I went to a, a, the mall the other day and I saw you can get a copy of the Holy Bible for $5, and, you know, a Nintendo GameCube costs like $300 or something like that, so where are our nation's priorities that, you know, the, this, the, the, you know, God's word here is only worth $5, whereas this little entertainment is, is so much more, 60 times that. So, you know, this nation's priorities are disgusting and shouldn't the price of the Bible be much higher? And if you said that, you know, that would be absurd and people, you know, even leftists wouldn't talk like that. Well, they don't like the Bible anyway. But you get the point. You could pick something leftist-like that is cheap, like the copy of uh, Communist Manifesto, perhaps. <laughs> All right, so, or the New York Times, right? The New York Times should be $50 a copy and it's not. And so where are our nation's priorities? What are, what are we saying about the quality of, a, of the media if, you know, newspapers are so cheap? Right, if you talk like that, that would just be patently absurd. That would be silly, and nobody would, would buy into that, right? And, but that, that's exactly what's going on when it comes to labor, right? The same principles are involved, that just because a particular unit of labor gets a low price in the marketplace doesn't mean, therefore, society thinks that that commodity uh, has a low ethical value or isn't important to our civilization. Okay? And again, if you, just, you get lost and then just think through again to the, to the Bible that it actually would be bad if a Bible cost $500 because then it, you wouldn't be able to hand them out to people. Right? It would be really expensive. There would be fewer Bibles going around. By the same token, if what you want is to give high school mathematics lectures to as many people as possible, you want math teachers to get a low salary because if they earned as much as professional athletes did, their school, local school boards wouldn't be able to afford as many. Right, only the cream of the crop students could go and, and learn about trigonometry. All right, so if you, if you think it through and just push it a little bit, you'd realize it would be terrible if mathematics teachers earned what professional athletes did. And again, the, the reason for that it has to do with scarcity. It's what economists often talk about is the so-called water-diamond paradox, where this is something classical economists talked about, that, of course, water is essential for life. It's very important. And yet, diamonds are a frippery that, you know, you can use them to make drill bits and things like that in certain applications. But really, diamonds are just pretty to look at. They're not essential for life. And yet, water is very cheap. However, we only want to define a unit of water, whereas diamonds are very expensive. And so why is that? There seems to be a disconnect. And the answer just has to do with scarcity, with supply and demand, if you want to think in those terms, that relative to human beings' uses for it, there's a lot more water than we need. Whereas with diamonds, it's the opposite, that for the things we want to do, for the rings we want to put it in, or their necklaces or what have you, earrings, putting it in certain uh, cutting instruments, there aren't that many diamonds to go around, or it's very difficult to get them in the form that we need. And so that's why in a marketplace, those are the prices. It's not a reflection of how important are they to our civilization. And so it's the same thing when it comes to price of labor. Now, of course, there, it's, it strikes certain people closer to home that the price of a Bible it per se isn't directly related to someone's income. The person selling the Bible could just sell more. And so if a Bible drops in price, that doesn't necessarily mean someone has less money to take home to his family. Whereas, yes, if you're a certain worker and the price of your labor goes down, then obviously that's going to influence you more. So I don't mean to deny that there is 
some difference between these types of cases I'm talking about, but the difference is not coming in because society doesn't care about teachers, right? as, the, as the Bible example demonstrates. So let me uh, just deal with one other topic, and then I'll open it up for questions, and that has to do with the minimum wage, and it's again related to, to salaries. And so here the argument is, in a free market, if... If it, if it weren't for this wise institution, the government protecting us with the minimum wage, then obviously all these poor people would just be getting pennies an hour. I mean, just look at what wages were before the minimum wage was instituted, and now they're, they're much higher. And there are all these people earning the minimum wage, and obviously they, it's, it's still not enough. We should raise it, and that's the argument. But at least we've got that bare minimum, because otherwise these uh, greedy employers would just push it way down. They'd collude with each other and keep prices, or the wages down to basically a subsistence level, because those people have no bargaining power. They'd all be starving to death were it not for the minimum wage. So a bunch of different responses you can make to that. And the first, the one my personal favorite is, well, if that's true, if that's your worldview, and now we do have this minimum wage, how come everybody doesn't earn the minimum wage, right? If that's their mentality that these you know, employ, employees would be just helpless in the face of all of these powerful employers because you, know, you, have to, you have to work, you really can't be too choosy if you got a family to feed, how come everybody isn't earning the minimum wage when in fact it's really a, a very low percentage of the population? How come brain surgeons aren't all earning the minimum wage because the greedy hospitals collude with each other and say, you know, let's just pay these guys two dollars an hour or, let's, or whatever the minimum wage is, let's pay them uh, $5.50 an hour, 5 dollars an hour and it just keep their wages down because, you know, they have to eat, so what, what are we going to do? I mean, what are they going to do? They, they can't just quit. And if you think about that, that's obviously silly, that no, the reason the vast majority of people in the United States earn far more than the minimum wage is because of competition. That if hospitals really did collude and hold down the price of brain surgeons in one region, well, hospitals in the city right next to them would pay them a little bit more to entice them to come over there and say, we'll give you $30 an hour. Because obviously they can charge their customers, the patients, a lot more for the services that the brain surgeons are supplying, right? And so that process would just happen until workers generally receive what economists call their marginal revenue product, right? So if you think about it, you've got a worker, if you as a firm know, if I hire this person, he's going to bring in certain revenues. Let's say he brings in $50,000 a year more in sales because I hired this person than if I didn't. That means the employer knows I could pay up to $50,000 a year, you know, taking consideration of taxes and things like that and then I would still be making money. I'm not going to pay $60,000 a year for someone who only adds 50 grand to my bottom line because then I'd be losing $10,000 on the worker. But as long as what I'm paying out is less than what the person's bringing in to my bottom line, then I make money. And so if, of course, employers would love to pay less than that, to pay much less than that, and to get a bigger gain from the worker, but they can't stop their competitors from offering a little bit more and trying to entice them away. Right? So if you're earning... $30,000 a year on this worker because you're underpaying him by that much, what's to stop your competitor from offering him 10000 more? Because your competitor then would still be earning 20000 on that guy, but then you would just try to bid him back, and so you see how it works. So it, it's, it's not perfect, of course, and there's all sorts of complications that it's not, it's not obvious when you look at a particular worker, how much are you going to add to my bottom line this year? For all you know, the person's going to be showing up to the job drunk and, and stealing from you. But the point is, over time, in general, workers tend to get paid their marginal revenue product. So now when it comes to very low-skilled workers, people that really only contribute, let's say, $2 an hour to the, to the company, and the government comes along and says, no, it is illegal for you to pay those workers that wage. If you want to hire this person, you have to pay them whatever it is, five, what is the minimum wage, you guys know? Okay, that's a good answer, depends on the state. I was thinking the federal one. Okay, so you guys are all obviously well-educated college students, you don't even know what the minimum wage is, and neither do I. But whatever the wage, it's, it's five-something at the federal level. Now, the, if the person can only add two or three dollars to the firm's bottom line, and the government says it is illegal for you to pay that, you have to pay five sixty-five, whatever it is, obviously, is the firm going to hire that person and just eat the loss? They're going to say, oh, well, we've got to hire this person because of this dumb law. I'm losing two dollars and change per hour on this worker. No, they're just going to refrain from hiring that person in the first place. And so that's why in particular areas of the country where there are a lot of unskilled workers, and you can speculate as to why that is, I, I think it's because of uh, 
uh, the enforcement of certain drug laws and the public schools are terrible in those areas and the effects of welfare and you know leading to single parent families things like that but for whatever reason in certain areas certain neighborhoods there are a lot of people who are not able to to earn the or not able to contribute to a company what the minimum wage says that they need to be paid and so again those people just don't get hired they never get their foot in the door and they never learn the skills how to show up on time how to handle the cash register how to deal with customers things like that they don't learn those basic skills and so they once you're unemployed for a long time you become unemployable all right so far from helping the underclass is what they think they're doing or the low skilled people the minimum wage law precisely hurts those people it doesn't affect the brain surgeon because they weren't going to be paid anywhere near the minimum wage in the first place all right so this and all sorts of other myths I, I deal with in my book to show that actually a free market helps people. It is, it is not unfair and cruel, and the government program designed to offset the alleged monstrous effects of a free market actually end up hurting the very people it's supposed to help. And I'll uh, open up for questions. All right. I hope we have some questions lighting up. Uh, and before we take your questions, I just have to disagree with you about one point. Uh, I, I think most women would believe that diamonds are an essential commodity. Uh, all right, we'll take questions. I'm not going to give you a chance to answer that question. <laughs> Uh, my name is Orit Slar. I recently just graduated from Georgia Tech with a degree in civil engineering and with a focus in water treatment. And one of the things that um, continually came up was how expensive it is um, to treat water. I mean, when you're talking about drinking water, even waste, waste treatment facilities um, to put water back into a river, it leads to pollution and everything. So my, um, my greatest concern is that water isn't being treated in the market as a scarce resource, even though it is in many areas and even across the United States. It's um, in Georgia, Florida, Alabama have um, extreme water issues and across the, um, the world you can see that there are, I mean, fights being um, between countries that have been because water is so scarce. So I was wondering if you could comment on that and how maybe subsidies or governments um, play a key role in um, pricing out water. So there's a few, a few just general remarks about water, and then I'll try to answer your specific question. So one thing is, uh, just to, I think one of the best examples of how the government just does a terrible job at the various things it tries to do is that we pay for our municipal water that you know you go to the tap and you turn it on, and yet a lot of Americans now, when they go to drink water, they go to the store and they buy bottled water that private companies supply to them because they trust that more. They don't trust whatever the heck comes out of their, their tap. And you know, if you just think about it, it's virtually free for you to drink the the, uh, the tap water, and yet, you know, in terms of a given glass of water, and yet most people prefer to, to go to Sam's or wherever and just load up on the bottled water. So I think that's just a great example when it comes to, in general, uh, the free market or the private sector versus government. That even when you're you're forced to buy these government services, a lot of people still, nonetheless, say, okay, we already paid for this in a sense because there's a local monopoly and we have to have running water for the lawn and what have you, but. When it comes to water, I want to drink. I'm actually still going to go and pay more for the, the uh, private sector water. Now, as far as uh, things like pollution and how you treat water, a lot of that has to do with the fact that there really aren't secure property rights in that. So it's not that there's Jim Smith owns this lake over here, and if you want to use his water, you have to pay for it, just like Jim Smith owns his house, and if you want to to knock it down and build a mall or something. You, well, it used to be the case you'd have to pay for it. Uh, this gets back to the uh, Supreme Court decisions. It, it, it's even hard to use reductio ad absurdums anymore because everything you can think of, like, well, that would be like, is, oh, wait, that happened two years ago. And, all right, so, there, there, but the point is there aren't secure property rights in water, and uh, I think Tom Woods could probably comment uh, more knowledgeably on this, but what happened is in the early 1900s, or probably late 1800s, early 1900s, local governments actually overturned common law precedents where if you lived downstream on a river and some factory upstream was polluting, you could go and, and, and charge them. You say, you're, you're, you're violating my property rights, and so either pay me to allow this to continue or stop. And that was, that was the law, the law of the land that came over from England. And yet local governments, because they thought, no, we need to promote the Industrial Revolution, overturned that because they were in cahoots with these you know, industrial uh, companies. And so a lot of the protection of 
wa bodies of water actually was overturned in the name of promoting industrialization. We have several questions, so let's try to ask some quick questions and quick answers. Yes. Um, yeah, sometimes I just have a hard time grasping exactly what kind of economy we do have in the United States. Since we're not purely capitalist and we're not really socialist, do you have a term or a way you would describe our economy here, and do you think it leans more one way or the other? Well, as far as, you know, a lot of people say we basically live under socialism or is it heavily regulated capitalism, Ludwig von Mises had a really crisp answer. He said, if a country, if the government allows for there to be a private stock market where the individual citizens can own shares in the major companies, then it's basically a capitalist system, albeit perhaps heavily regulated. Whereas if there's not uh, private ownership of the actual major corporations, then that's that's basically a socialist system. So on that ground, we we do have a capitalist system. Uh, it's actually you, you don't want to use the term just because the left throws it around so much and it's been such an abused term. But it, th what we have is actually a, a sort of fascism where you have nominally private ownership, but yet the government heavily regulates it. Now again, that's a, an inflammatory term, but it's it's basically a capitalist system that's that's a very heavily regulated. Uh, hello. I have a question regarding your uh, assertion that capitalism properly punishes uh, all forms of discrimination, just in the sense that if, suppose, nepotism was uh, rampant in the economy, then the skills level of the people and of the workers would seem to go down because the most qualified people would not be getting experience, they would not be getting a chance to grow and improve their abilities. And I don't see how capitalism, pure free market capitalism, could really punish those sorts of negative effects of discriminatory practices. Okay, um, I'm not sure I follow the question, but if you're, you're right that if there were rampant nepotism or other forms of discrimination, probably uh, the most qualified people wouldn't be getting uh, the experience to become even more qualified, but it would still be the case that each individual act of nepotism would be costing that particular employer, un unless, if it, if it weren't justified though, if the, if the guy's brother-in-law really was the best applicant for the job, then that wouldn't be the bad discrimination we're talking about. My question is more like the short versus the long-term sense. It seems to me like your argument deals with a lot of the short-term problems and like that specific employment action. But like I was just wondering what are the uh, consequences for long-term impact on the economy and how can capitalism properly punish that? Okay, what you're saying is not only should you be punished for the immediate, this guy's worth 50,000, this guy's worth 40,000, you're leaving 10 grand on the table, but thinking beyond the, the qualifications. Well, again, if if by signing up the one person he would be an employee with your company for a long time and he would grow on the job and develop again that's uh, you're, you're right I mean there's possible externalities that you're ignoring if he went to a different company but it certainly does punish a lot of the it makes him suffer a lot of consequences. The question is do you support free trade with like a communist country that may be engaging in like slave labor or something similar where the workers don't really have any choice and as like the wood in a free market on whether they're working? Yeah, that that's a tricky question. Uh, my general reflexive answer is, is yes, that I don't think the federal government should be in the business of um, setting those things, if only for a practical reason, that if that's the alleged reason, I think there's going to be a lot of products that are kept out that aren't produced by, by slave labor, that it's going to be special interest getting protection for their domestic U.S. manufacturing uh, interests and that that's the, the official reason. Now, I'm not denying that there are uh, certain uh, plants that where the laborers are not going there through entirely voluntary means, but I, I don't think the answer is to have the federal government try to put up a wall. Well, the country that does employ near slave labor is China. What if they put poison in our cat food and in our toothpaste and in our cough syrup? What are we going to do about that? And there's no way we can regulate what they're doing. I just want to say also, if, if anyone on C-SPAN is watching, I am against poisoning pets. That's, I'm against that. Um, but but even, seriously, even there though, again, I, I think it's, and I'm not saying that's what was just suggested, but it's, I think it's very uh, dangerous to think, okay, let's solve the problem, let's have senators take care of it. That's not really going to uh, work. What's going to happen is Walmart and the other uh, retailers who are getting suppliers from these countries they need to be more on the ball, and if they continue to buy products from them, that you know, if they were selling TVs that blew up, 
that would be bad for business. All right? And so by the same token, now people can, if, if people really think anything coming from China is, is suspect, then Walmart or whoever the retailer is can say, okay, we, we only go to reputable sources at this point, and that would be good for business. Hi, I'm Blaine Bennett from Arizona State University. And I just wanted to have you comment on what you thought about colleges or schools and businesses getting tax cuts or funding by having certain percentages of, um, like, having diverse students or diverse workforce by, you know, like hi hiring a Mexican or giving a scholarship to a Mexican as opposed to a white American, and just what you thought on that. Well, the easy answer is I think it, there shouldn't be government-funded education in the first place, and that, that would eliminate most of the problem. Um, now, let me, let me take the question in its most difficult form. You know, should there, of course, I'm generally for any tax break. You don't even have to tell me what it is. Just you're going to cut someone's taxes. It's great. As opposed to a subsidy, that if it's funneling actual tax dollars to someone, then that I'm reflexively opposed to. But if it's actually reducing someone's tax bill, you don't need to say any more, I'm, I'm on board. But again, it's, it's tricky if, what if the tax cut is tied into things that I generally am opposed to? So what if you, you know, said to people, well, cut your income taxes as long as you teach your kids not to read the books by, by the um, regnery, then it would be tricky uh, you know, to do a strategic consideration. But um, no, I mean, to answer your question, if, I, if there were two different tax bills and one would just be a blanket, let's cut everyone's income taxes a certain amount versus let's give all these targeted things to try to alter people's behavior, I would of course prefer uh, just the general give people their money back and let them do what they want with it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. The Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism. Economist Robert Murphy writes for web magazines LewRockwell.com and TownHall.com. This event was part of Politically Incorrect Guide Day 2007, sponsored by the Eagle Forum. For more information, visit EagleForum.org.